We welcome you to our Wednesday Lenten worship service. Now, last week, we were able to gather together on Sunday morning and Saturday night as a congregation, and we made a few adjustments. We, we did not shake hands. We did not hug. We kept our social distancing um, as we should have. But now things have changed once again, and we are unable to gather together in groups of more than 50. So because things have changed, we're moving to an online format, and we pray that this is a blessing to you as we walk through our worship services, as we supply them for you online and maybe in different um, formats as, as well as we can. But we continue our worship together as God's people, as St. Paul and McAllen, and we just move forward as best we can with the ever-changing situation in our country, in the world, and everywhere. So we pray that this is a blessing for you. We have supplied online a bulletin that you can access. You can download that bulletin and print it out, or you can just follow along as the service goes, however you choose to do that. We encourage you to do that. We encourage you to speak with me, the congregation parts, and participate in worship. We encourage you to sing the hymns, to uh, pray the prayers with us, and we're going to move forward as normal as we poss normally as we possibly can as we work through this crisis, as we keep our world and our community in our prayers. So tonight, today, we celebrate the Lenten worship service. Um, we are in the third week of Lent, and we continue with our series from the book of Exodus, let my people go. And today we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 17 as we do that. I am Pastor Lorenz, senior pastor here at St. Paul Lutheran Church, and we welcome you to worship today. And we begin today with our invocation and our call to worship. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we continue with our responsive readings. God did miracles for our ancestors on the plain of Zoan in the land of Egypt. He divided the sea and led them through making the water stand up like walls. He led them by a cloud and all night by a pillar of fire. He split open the rocks in the wilderness to give them water as from a gushing spring. He made streams pour from the rock, making the waters flow like a river. And we continue now with our opening hymn, Christ the life of all the living, we sing stanzas one through three.
And we continue now with our confession and our absolution. Hear me, merciful and mighty Father, as I confess my bondage to sin and death. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do good, but I cannot carry it out. What I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. In my inner being, I delight in your law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war and making me a prisoner of the law of sin and death. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And we take several moments now in silence as we reflect on the fact that our sin is great, but Christ's love for us is even greater. And now hear the good news. The same God who delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage also delivers you from your body of sin and death. Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, has been sacrificed and his blood forgives you and sets you free. He made streams pour forth from the rock, making the waters flow like a river. We continue now singing our hymn verse of Christ the life of all the living. And the Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful Father, through Moses you provided water for the people to drink. Quench our spiritual thirst through the one who is greater than Moses, Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. In his name we pray. Amen. And we continue now with our scripture readings. Our first reading comes to us from Exodus chapter 17, and we will be focusing in on that reading for our message today. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. 
And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our Holy Gospel lesson is from John chapter 4, the familiar account of the woman at the well. Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And we continue now confessing our Christian faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we continue now with the singing of our next hymn, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. Thank you.
Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we're continuing in our series for Wednesdays, Let My People Go. And we find God's people now, once again, in the wilderness, in the desert, and they are thirsty. Can you think of a time in your life when you were thirsty? Now, I don't just mean, you know, I need to go get a drink. I mean, thirsty so that you thought that you were going to die. You see, when we don't get enough water, there's some physiological things that happen with our body. You may have experienced that before. We get tired, we get dizzy, we get anxious, our joints can start to ache. Sometimes we get miserable and grouchy and even angry. And what does all that mean? What does all that add up to? It adds up to a bad life. So what's the point? The point for our message tonight is we all need water. We need lots of water. When we don't get enough water, one of the things that can happen is our body can confuse thirst for hunger. For example, I had a friend who was once on a diet. He was trying to lose some weight. And one of his diet rules was that he would not eat anything past 6 o'clock in the evening. And he said if he got hungry after 6 o'clock, what would he do? He would drink a glass of water. And if that didn't work and he was still hungry, what would he do? He said he would drink another glass of water. He knew that if your body doesn't get enough water, it can confuse that thirst for hunger. And then what happens? Well, if you're on a diet, you don't eat right, and you eat when you're not supposed to, and it all backfires and you gain weight. Well, as we continue in our series in this book of Exodus, we look at Exodus chapter 17, and to help us walk through that, we're going to use some questions, some very familiar questions. We're going to use the who, what, where, why, how, and when questions as we walk through our message tonight. And once again, the point of the sermon, we all need water. We need lots of water. So our first question is this, who? And the first answer that we have to that question is the Israelites. The Israelites had lived in Egypt near the Nile River now in slavery for over 400 years. And each generation didn't necessarily remember the beginning of that, but they all talked about the good life that they had there, eating the leeks and the onions by the Nile. And when the Israelites left Egypt, once again, they really didn't have any problems with water. God even used water as a way of salvation for his people. Think about it. If you need that water to stand up in walls and create a dry path for the people to pass through on the Red Sea, no problem. If you need that water to come crashing down on Pharaoh's horses and chariots, no problem. God can handle that too. Our next question would be, who? And the answer to that question, a fuller answer to that same question, would be the Israelites and Moses. We learned that the name Moses means what? It literally means drawn out or taken out of the water. As a child, Moses was placed into the water for his own safety. And once again, he was drawn out of that water for his salvation. God used that water as a means of salvation. Later on, Zipporah, who would become Moses' wife, described Moses like this. She mistook him for an Egyptian, but she said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hands of the shepherd and even drew water for us and watered our flock. Later on, in Exodus chapter 15, when Moses was confronted with bitter water, 
Moses takes a piece of wood at God's command and he throws it in that putrid pool and presto, instant purified water. Kind of reminds me of an episode in our training as we were training to become missionaries. Part of that training was a 30-mile hike through a dry Texas river bed. And one of the things that we needed to do was find and purify our own water along the way. The riverbed was dry, just full of stones, but every once in a while there would be a small pool of water. And we finally decided to replenish our supplies, and there was a pool of water there. It was a little bit green, it was a little bit murky, and as I looked around, I even saw the skeleton of some poor, rather large animal that was right on the edge of this pool of water. But of course, after boiling the water to purify it, that water became our drinking water. I wish at that time I would have known Moses uh, throw the stick in the water trick there and used that. But that's the who. It's Moses and Israel. Our next question what? What is it? Exodus chapter 17, there was no water for the people to drink. There's a lack of water. The Israelites left Egypt in chapter 14, and now they've been in the wilderness, in the desert, for about a month. They've seen nothing but rocks and sand and dirt. Rocks and sand and dirt over and over again. We all know what it feels like to be without water, to have no water. We have those what we call dry spells in our life, don't we? Even when we talk about it figuratively. In life, there's different kinds of thirsts, aren't there? There's emotional thirst when things hurt so badly in our lives. There's spiritual thirst when we say, God, if you're so good, why do I hurt so badly? God, why do you seem to be so far away? God, do you even exist? There's also relational thirst when our relationships in life run dry. And there's also that thirst for normalcy in life. And we just wish that things were back to the way that they used to be. And I think we're feeling a lot of that these days with the coronavirus and all of the hype and the precautions that we are taking. So Moses cries out to the Lord. He cries out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They are ready to stone me. And what do we do? What do we do when we're overcome by those different types of thirsts in life? Just like the people of Israel we want to pick up some stones and throw some rocks, right? Remember that scene from the movie Forrest Gump? Remember that scene when Jenny begins to hurl those rocks at her childhood home? You can see the pain and the frustration and the emotional hurt that the memories of that place brought to her in her mind. And when she runs out of rocks to throw, she just falls to the ground. And do you remember what Forrest Gump said? He said, sometimes there just aren't enough rocks. But really, Forrest Gump was wrong. We thirst so much for love and acceptance that when we don't get it, we begin to throw rocks also. Oh, not literal rocks, but we launch verbal missiles. We launch nuclear words, silent stares, angry texts, whatever it might be. And sadly, there are always enough rocks to throw. And this breaks God's heart. So we move on to our next question, where? We're told that God's people camped at Rephidim. Do you know that no one knows where Rephidim really was? Scholars don't know it. Archaeologists haven't found it. All the people could say was that Rephidim was near Mount Sinai. But you and I, we know the exact location of Rephidim. 
Rephidim is that figurative place in our lives where we are burned out. We fear and we, we just can't manage our life and we don't know what to do. Loneliness is too heavy to bear. Doubts and, and just all kinds of fears fill our lives. Confusion overwhelms us. Rephidim is that place where relationships are dehydrated and dry and almost dead. Rephidim is where it seems like the coronavirus is taking over the world. We can't get what we need at the grocery store. We're almost afraid to leave our very homes. And sadly, Rephidim is also in every church. It's the place where, try as we might, everything stays dry and as dry as dust. At Rephidim, we cry out like the words that we read in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. At Rephidim, we we echo those words of anguish in Psalm 63. It says, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And our next question, why? Why do we become so thirsty in life? And we land on the fact that it's the regrets that we carry, the woulda, coulda, shouldas in life. With an accusatory tone in Exodus chapter 17, the people look at Moses and they say, you brought us up out of Egypt. Translate that, it would be, we, we, if we would have stayed in Egypt, we, we would have been better off. If we could have stayed in Egypt, we would have what we need. We should have stayed in Egypt, that's where we belong. Who, what, where, why, the next one is how. How can we get the water that we need. How can we get water when we're out in the wilderness like God's people? God tells Moses to do something. He tells Moses to go and get his staff. Now this is not just any ordinary run-of-the-mill Walmart kind of walking stick. This is the staff of Moses. You remember Moses' staff. It's the staff that when he threw it down before Pharaoh, it became a serpent, and he picked it back up again, and it became that staff once more. It's the staff that Moses struck the Nile with, and the whole river turned to blood. It's the staff that he stretched out over the Red Sea, and the waters of the sea divided so that Israel could pass through on dry land. God says, take in your hand the staff and strike the rock and water will come out of it for my people to drink. And Moses did that and the water flowed and the people lived. Now, Paul, later on in the New Testament, reflects on this, and he connects that rock in the wilderness to Christ. He says, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Do you remember the staff that Jesus was given? As he was being mocked by the soldiers, they put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They would spit on him and they took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again. Yes, for our Lord and Savior Jesus, any ordinary run-of-the-mill staff will do. Any stick that remotely looks like a kingly scepter. Any piece of wood that wouldn't break that if you slapped it up against someone's head, it would not fall apart. And we make sure that that piece of wood is also carved, carved to a sharp point on the end. Because finally, the rock, Jesus, had to be split open. 
one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Water flowing from the one whose lips were parched and swollen. Water flowing from the one whose body was burnt under the hot Palestinian sun. Water gushing from the mouth of the one who cries out, I thirst. Strike the rock and water will come out of it and the people will drink. And on the cross it did. It flowed and we live. Isaiah describes God's soul-quenching love with these words. He says, The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground a bubbling spring. Ezekiel saw it also. He said it was a river teeming with life. Wherever the river flowed, everything would live. Joel writes about it also. He says a fountain will flow out of the Lord's house. And so there we have it, all of our questions. Who? Israel and Moses. What? There is no water. Where? Rephidim. Why? Woulda, coulda, shoulda. And how? Jesus, the rock of all ages. But what's missing? What's missing is our when. We are missing the when. Where does this water flow from? When does it come to me? When will it quench my thirst and my longing, aching heart? Jesus loves us so very, very much. When does the water flow? Well, the good news is it flows right now. It happens every day as God's living life-giving, soul-renewing renewing water flows from the cross for you and for me. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. And we continue now with worshiping the Lord with our tithes, our offerings, and our first fruits. And as you can see, if you have the printed bulletin in front of you, we have included the link for online giving. If that's not a possibility for you, uh, you can also mail your gifts to the church office and they will be received there. And realize that even in this time when we can't meet together as God's people in one place, the ministry still continues. Your ministry staff is working hard putting together these worship services, and we just appreciate your continued support of the ministry here at St. Paul. So we continue now by worshiping the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. And we continue now going to our Lord and Savior with our prayers and our petitions. Be present, merciful God, and protect us through the hours of the night so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of life may find our rest in you. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troubled life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at last. Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and drive from them all the snares of the enemy. Let your holy angel dwell with us to preserve us in peace, and let your blessing be upon us always. Eternal God, the hours of both day and night are yours, 
and to you the darkness is no threat. Be present, we pray, with those who labor in these hours of night, especially those who watch and work on our behalf and on the behalf of others. Grant them diligence in their watching, fearlessness in their service, courage in danger, and competence in emergencies. Help them to meet the needs of others with confidence and compassion. Abide with us, Lord, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us at the end of the day, at the end of our life, at the end of the world. Abide with us, with your grace and goodness, with your holy word and sacrament, with your strength and blessing. Abide with us when the night of affliction and temptation comes upon us, the night of fear and despair, the night when death draws near. Abide with us and all the faithful, now and forever. Amen. And we continue now by joining together and praying the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who made streams pour forth from the rock, make the waters flow like a river. Amen and amen. And we conclude our worship today with our closing hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. <laughs> 